Um, so I'm Tom McWell. Thank you very much for coming out at 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning. And I'm sure you're here for the talk. I'm just going to see the brightest and coolest and most pleasant thrill that we can to be in. So today I'm going to talk about uh, the Turing machine, which is a module I designed uh, six years ago now. Um, and the talk's really about the sort of experience of going from knowing very little, uh, great experience this kind of thing, to um, making something, publishing it, and it, it sort of finding an audience. So my uh, background was in was a journalist, was a magazine editor, uh, no technical background at all. Um, I'm always very intimidated when I meet people who are electrical engineers because they really know what they're doing. Um, but I got interested in this, uh, you know, probably around 2010. Um, made a few sort of little guitar pedals and things. Um, bought a Euro rack. The Euro rack system and the story about what I did next. So this is the this is the original prototype of the Turing machine, which you can see has got lots of little bodges and weird bits in here because it didn't really work. On the back is the same, uh, and this was the first ever um, circuit board that I designed. So I had designed some things or made modules myself before. So this is a kind of uh, FM radio. So this is a kind of board from a radio, sort of bodged into a module there. This was a kind of weird oscillator with a sort of homemade backdrop thing under there. Uh, and this was a spring reverb. And these, this is called Perth board, this kind of yellow board. And it, it lets you make something that is, it's sort of robust enough that it kind of works and you can use it, but it's, it's, pain to do and you can't really share it or distribute it. Once you've made it, you've made absolutely one. It's kind of handcrafted. You can't then make 10 of them or you can't explain to other people how to make them easily themselves. So I um, was interested in the idea of moving from this to trying to make something that I could distribute. Um, and the sort of, uh, the thing I wanted was based on using this. This is a sequence that I had. And I realized the way I used this was I would set all these knobs completely randomly, let it play for a bit, and then kind of tweak one knob and then listen to it for a bit. And it made this nice sort of, you know, pound shop, Philip Glass kind of videos and stuff. Uh, and I liked doing that, but it felt a bit sort of, um, it just felt wrong. You have this big complicated interface here, and I was just randomly setting these controls and it felt like it wasn't, it wasn't right. Uh, and around this time, so this was October 2011, uh, a blogger in Berlin called Nabs published this, which was, he had made this little kind of CV sequencer. Uh, and he, I think like me, I, I saw what he was doing, could see that he didn't have much technical background, but he was able to invent this little thing that he'd used as a, you know, he was using his rig, it seemed really interesting. And looking at this introduced me to all these new words that I hadn't heard before, like a shift register and a ring counter and a gated comparator. So I started reading up on this stuff. Um, and from the little, the few modules I've done before, I knew about chips like this. So this is a shift register chip, and I'm going to um, explain briefly what a shift register is in a minute. But the point with this is this chip costs like 30p maybe. And inside it are uh, probably dozens, maybe hundreds of transistors. And really, this is like a module in itself. So if you connect power up, just like 12 volts power straight out of your modular, if you connected a few um, just sockets onto some of these legs, you could actually make a module that would work. It would do something. It wouldn't be particularly refined, and it might not work in every case, and it might blow something up. But literally, you could take that chip, attach some sockets to it. So this is much more like a module than it is like uh, a sort of component. And once, once I realized this, you start to see that designing modules like this is more like Lego and less like, I don't know, astrophysics or A-level maths or something difficult. You know, it is, it is literally get the things and start plugging them together. So I will briefly explain what a shift register is. Uh, which, uh, I, well, I don't know, I'll try it. So essentially it's like a very, very, very short piece of memory for 
binary digits, so ones and zeros. So if you put, if you have a one there, and you pulse the clock here, it goes, ah, okay, what's in there? It's a one, I'll store a one here. You then pulse the clock again, that one will move across to here, and whatever you've got there moves into there. So it moves across. Does that make sense to anyone? Okay, there is some nodding. <laughs> so, uh, ultimately, it's like a very, very short delay. So you can find out, if you look here, you know what was there for clock pulses again, uh, away. This actual diagram, where you've got the out here, goes into the beginning, means this, as it's drawn, will actually do nothing. It will just be zero, 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 zero. The clock would pulse, zero comes out of there, goes back to the beginning, and it carries on being zero. So where it gets more interesting is, and don't try and concentrate too hard on what this is doing, this is a GIF from Wikipedia, <laughs> and you don't need to follow the noughts and ones, but the point is, um, here, you take a few of these signals out here, you add them together in a, in a sort of logic thing, you feed that back into the beginning, and what you get is a very rough, random number. So this will repeat after maybe 200 clicks or 300 clicks or something, but this feels kind of like it's random, and it's, sort of, and it's used as a random number generator. So. Uh, if you then, so that's, hold that in your mind, the random number generator thing. The other thing you need to understand is a digital to analog converter. So what that does is takes eight numbers here, so these are your points in your shift register, and if you remember doing binary at school where you count with noughts and ones, you can turn that into a number. So that number is the same as that, that number is the same as that, what the digital analog converter does is turns that into a voltage. So that's a high voltage, that's a lower voltage. So if you imagine from the previous one with it ticking along with a different, this kind of random number coming out, that becomes random voltages. So if you do that quickly, if you do it at like a, an oscillator speed, so like an audio oscillator, you get that sort of weird, grainy, pitched kind of white noise that is the sound of all these old video games. So every time there's an explosion, or a car engine, or any of those sounds from video games, is literally that shift register with the feedback in it, uh, in a chip, in your Atari, or your whatever it was. So that's at audio rates. If you do it um, more slowly, so it's like a sequencer, it's step by step, at a melodic speed, you get, you can make different interesting types of sequencer with this. So, all of these sequences are based on that sort of shift register idea, but done in lots of different ways. So, you've got the Buchler um, 266, which is kind of random module from the 70s. This is a Triadex Muse, which was invented at MIT in the 60s. This has all these kind of sliders determine how it feeds back into each other, itself. So it can make these long random sequences. And the idea of this was that you'd have this in your house, playing random bleepy music to yourself. Uh, and it came with a box next to it that had a light on it, so it could make psychedelic light patterns at the same time. Um, this is a Klee sequencer, which was a, a really big, popular, um, uh, but very kind of challenging DIY kit uh, from probably about 10 years ago. This is a gated comparator, which is actually very similar in many ways to the Turing machine, but as you can see, it has this quite, quite difficult interface. Um, I've only ever played one of these once, and I couldn't really understand what it was doing. Um, the noise ring, which is designed by Grant Richter, is again the same idea where you've got a shift register, but you do different things with it, uh, as is this is a blipu box by uh, Rob Hordit, which is the same as a, a um, what's the little one called? Benjamin. A Benjamin, yes. Uh, and that has a thing called a rungler in it, which again is exactly the same thing. It's a shift register, but generating these kind of sequences. And what's interesting for me with all of these is that none of them have computers in them. They are all these kind of digital things but they run with these chips rather than with somebody writing code. So there's no microprocessor in any of them. There's nobody sitting there writing code. 
adding features, changing things like that. And I don't really enjoy writing code, so I was quite drawn to these as a way of solving my problem with the sequencer that, that sort of annoyed me. <laughs> so I started experimenting with this. So this is a breadboard. Uh, what's really nice about breadboard is that you can you use real components, you use real wires to connect them together, and you can create something that is actually real. You can actually use it and plug it into your modular, you can use it. It is the same as the thing you make at the end. Uh, and it's relatively quick to do. This is, uh, this is actually the one from Design the Turing Machine. At this point, I had these kind of buttons here to try and sort of punch numbers into the shift register. That was the sort of display that's on the, on the finished one. Uh, but you can actually, this is nice because you, you're making the real thing, but it's still quite complicated and difficult to use. The other thing I used a lot was, um, this is the Nord modular demo software that's free, um, and you can just about get it running on computers nowadays. This has in it shift registers and logic gates and buttons and white noise generators and all the things you need, again, to build this sort of stuff. So with this, you can do it very, very quickly, kind of patch ideas together. Um, and experiments. I did a lot of sketching, drawing things out, trying to figure out how this stuff works, trying to learn it, trying to find something that was, I suppose, different from what anyone else had done. Um, and at the same time as all this, I was trying to work out what the interface was. You know, what was what was I actually going to be playing with? So these are some of the early versions of that, where you've got these kind of funny like loop and fill switches, which I had at that stage. Some of these things, like these sort of gates and triggers, became the um, expanders later on. Uh, but there was a lot here that just doesn't, you know, this, this data in socket, which I have no idea really what you'd put into that and how that would work. But as I was building it, it would have needed a data in socket at some point. The other thing I was doing at this stage was reading a lot, reading, um, other people writing about this stuff. This is um, Don Booker's sketch schematics for that um, source of uncertainty. And when I first looked at this, it seemed so impenetrable and so like these mysterious kind of runes on, on a piece of paper. But gradually, as I was learning it, you started to be able to spot what he was doing with things. And now when I look at it, you can just see there are so many clever little you know, just amazing, clever little features that he's put in there. Um, but it's a very kind of gratifying to learn and see, you know, when you get that deep into something, that you can look at something like that and go, oh, I see what he's done there. And that's his shift register at the top of that, as I'm sure you all noticed. Um, uh, so I did, you know, you go through cycles of doing this. So it was a lot of building things, reading things, trying to get the thing to do something interesting. And I had this kind of breakthrough. Uh, where I sort of worked out I could do this. So your shift register finishes here, something comes out of here, it's either a naught or a one. You go through, and one version you invert, so if it was a one, it's a naught. The other one you leave it is. And you have a thing here that basically lets the system choose, do I want the inverted version or the not inverted version? And it's got a bit of random in it. Uh, this is not explaining it very clearly, but the point is, the loop goes around, and if you never invert it, so it just does that, it just loops around forever uh, in a repeating sequence. If you do that, it loops around for twice as long as it plays, then it turns upside down, and it plays again. But if you have it in the middle, it adds a bit of randomness, so it makes it a bit more random, and depending on where you put the control, it makes it more random. It is quite a difficult module to explain, this one. Um, and this was, once I had the revelation, my breadboard supported a large knob in the middle, which meant I could, it was that control. And that was really the thing that I was like, oh, okay, I can now see this is something different. I don't think anyone's quite done that before. Uh, and I was amazed when I looked back at my notebooks last week, this sketch, which is basically as it was finished, uh, apart from a chaos trigger input, which I have no idea what that was supposed to do, but I think everyone should have a chaos trigger somewhere. Um, so you get that sketch, and around this time, so this was 2012, there was a sort of change happening in the way people were doing DIY. So you had 
what I have rather unfairly referred to as old school DIY, which was had been going on sort of since the 70s and was often people with a more technical background. Um, it was, this one's not home much, but people etching their own PCBs in baths and acid at home. Uh, this incredible kind of wiring that they had to do to connect it up. Often the bigger formats, so big sort of MOOC formats. Um, often, you know, a really strong community, and there's an awful lot of information in this community that you can get, but there was often a sense of copywriting and people owning designs, that sort of thing. Uh, and these beautiful, expensive panels that were engraved in, in aluminium. Uh, but sort of big and expensive and, and sort of quite difficult. And so around 2010, you started to get the, a few things happen. You had the sort of maker movement. Um, so you had maker fairs happening. I think the first Brighton maker fair was probably 2010, 2011. Um, you also started to get access to the Chinese supply chain. So around this time, I realized that you could send off a file to Shenzhen in China with like 25 quid and they would send you some PCB back that were beautifully fabricated, just you know, professionally fabricated. Uh, Euro rack meant you could design things differently so you didn't need all this wiring, you could just stick the pots in and the sockets in. It became a lot easier. Um, and for panels, you could get acrylic laser cut panels very cheaply, which I use at the start. Or again, you could use that printed circuit board systems to, to print panels easily. So it kind of went from to my mind, this kind of big and quite difficult way of doing things uh, to something that could be a bit cheaper and easier and also could be distributed. So I could say, these are the files you need and people could go off and make the thing themselves. In order to make something, you then need to learn this program, which is Eagle, uh, which is this terrible program <laughs> used on uh, printed circuit boards. Anyone who has learned it has this kind of Stockholm syndrome. So for me, I would always use Eagle and I will, I, I've learned it. I'm never going to try and learn something else because I would commit so much time to try and learn Eagle. Uh, but this is very early on. And if you are, if anyone here is a circuit board designer, you will look at this and go, what has he done? This is, this is a horrific circuit board. Because when I designed this, I couldn't root boards by hand. So I got my components, you plonk them down, and then there's a button that says auto root, and it roots it. And sometimes it doesn't work, so you then have to move some components around, then you press it again. And eventually you get it so it works. So this is a really, really ugly, crude, auto-rooted PCB. Uh, but it did remarkably work, apart from all the little plugges that I had to fix afterwards. So once you've got your PCB, you then need to make a panel. These are the sort of paper printed out panels. Um, I always quite like this one on the end, but somehow I decided to end up doing these two. And again, when you're doing this, there's a bunch of research you do. So this is the Vorticist magazine blast, which was basically what was ripped off for that there, more or less. Uh, and this one, which you can't see that clearly, but it's a kind of spirograph pattern, is essentially, I always like the design of this thing, and couldn't draw it quite right, but. That's where the idea came from. So this is, when you're making the, the laser cut panels, you design them literally in Illustrator. So you just draw the lines of different colors uh, and then send them off to anyone with a laser cutter and they cut them out. And they come back looking like this, uh, which is going to be very pleasing when it first happens, you first fabricate something and it comes back. So after you know a couple of months, really, I had made this thing. So this was, was that journey from, I would quite like something that sort of does repeating patterns, but slips and changes, uh, to actually being able to, to just about get there and, and have that thing working. Um, and at that point, as I said, the, the idea was that I would publish this as a piece of open source hardware. So that was something that was started, again, around 2010, was the idea of these open source hardware licenses, where people can use things, they can modify them. If they modify them, they have to put it under the same license. Uh, and it's obviously built from open source software. It's the same sort of idea. So my initial idea was that I would publish these files and say, if you want the panels, you just send this to a laser cutter and they can do it for you. If you want the boards, you send it to China and they can make it for you. If you want the bits, here's the list from um, Mouser or someone like that, and they can send it back to you. 
So I published it on uh, Mark Wiggler saying, I have made this thing. And I was looking at the dates, it's less than 12 hours later, uh, Steve, wherever he is, um, uh, this is Steve, who now runs Thonk, uh, said, oh, I'll tell you what, I might help you get some of these parts together uh, so you don't have to send it off here, you don't have to send it off here, you don't have to send it off there. Uh, and that, I think, is essentially one of, the, one of the things that started Thonk going, was that idea of he can do that work to gather the parts and make the kits. Um, so it was quite a, that was a very unexpected thing. I wasn't kind of expecting that how it worked, but it worked very nicely. It meant, meant the things got made a lot more easily and efficiently than I think they would have done the way I had imagined it happening. So six years later, um, I was amazed that was actually, uh, it's June the 2nd, so yeah, it's just over, just over six years ago. Um, so now all sorts of kind of weird things have happened uh, with the Turing machine. It has been, you know, very popular. Uh, I was amazed to have Dave from Blur <laughs> spend his evening eating pop chips and making a Turing machine at home. Uh, Timberland, the R&B producer, posted a video with him playing with a Turing machine. Uh, Surgeon, the techno DJ, used one a lot and was one of the first sort of beta testers of the, the revised one I did a few years later. There's software versions of it in, in BCV Rack and in, in Reactor Blocks, I think. There's other modules that have taken and put it into their own modules, so the um, Ornament and Crime, I think, has Turing machines inside it. Uh, and Thonk is now a vast you know, enterprise down the road in Brighton with dozens of staff and, and shiny new offices. Um, so that's kind of the story, of the, the journey that I've been on. Um, and I suppose my sort of punchline or my kind of message with this always is you can go from literally knowing nothing about electronics uh, and having no background and being terrible at maths you know, no real evidence of being good at physics or anything like that, um, to creating something that gets into the hands of lots and lots of people and, you know, spreads. Uh, you know, anyone can do it, and it's about that, that going through that process and you learn kind of as you go along. So I look forward to coming back here in years to come and seeing people in this room having, having done similar things. When I do workshops, it's always saying, if you come to a workshop, if you're making something... I started out all of this going to a workshop done by um, Tom Bugs, who's a designer from Bristol. He did a little workshop in Brick Lane in London. I turned up, held a soldering iron for the first time, you know, put a kit together, and that's how you start and the process you go through. And that's me.